Good day, everyone, and welcome. My name is Matt Smith. I'm the director of training at Corvell, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to our presentation, which we are conducting with Hannah Brophy Law Firm in California to review Assembly Bill 685 as it's related to COVID-19. Before we begin, I would just like to let everyone know that we are recording the call. The audience lines are muted, but I'd like to direct everyone's attention to the Q&A pane, which you should see in the lower right corner of the screen. Please feel free to ask any questions or make comments in the Q&A pane, and we'll be reviewing it throughout the presentation, and we will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. And with that, I would like to introduce Michelle Tucker, Corvell's Vice President of Enterprise Comp Services. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is actually our second webinar um, relative to California COVID-19 legislation. Our first webinar addressed Senate Bill 1159, actually myself and one of our panelists today um, uh, presented that um, piece of legislation and some information. It was also recorded, so if anyone on this line would like uh, to get a copy of that recording, certainly reach out to us and we'll make sure that gets distributed over to you. Um, today's session was originally solely dedicated to AB 685. And of course that's um, COVID-19 infection prevention requirements, which become effective in January. But while we were preparing for this session, um, as is true with California, uh, Cal OSHA has now issued some temporary emergency COVID-19 safety standards. So thankfully our esteemed panel um, hustled mightily to include some information about that in today's presentation. So we'll be able to include that again, this is recorded and we'll distribute this information out to those who signed up to participate today. In the interest of time, however, we have a lot of content to cover. I'm going to move quickly uh, from my end, and I'm very pleased to introduce again Brenna Hampton, who is the managing partner for the law offices of Hannah and Brophy out of San Diego. And Brenna is going to lead the Hannah Brophy team today um, in walking through some very important information. And then again, at the end, we will cover uh, Q&A that you may post in the chat pane throughout the session. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Brenna. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you to Corbell for having us out here. Um, this is a, a very trying time for employers in California. Um, Hannah Brophy does all employer defense, so we've been hearing uh, from all of you, um, those we work with and those we don't, who are just tossing their um, trying to figure out how you could possibly continue Number seven, very expensive. So I think it's worth um, taking just a moment um, to kind of orient ourselves right now. And if you know me, then you know that I am a California hippie to the extent that I do believe in mindfulness. I do believe in breathing exercises. Uh, I've written a lot of articles about it. And I, I think that without getting too hippie, hippie, la la here, um, this is a good time, not just during the webinar today, but in general in our lives, we're getting into the holiday season. We've all been racing to comply with SB 1159 and all these other regulatory changes. So I just wanna encourage everybody to just take a breath because a lot of what we're talking about, especially today with AB 685, you're gonna see that it's very definitional. You're not gonna have a lot of law to memorize the way we did with SB 1159. What you're gonna to have to do is take what you learn and go back to your work site and just put sensible procedures in place for notice and for reporting. It's that simple and it's also not that simple. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is the not so simple part of it because as one of my law professors once said, if you can't express something simply, you don't really understand it. So our goal today is to try to get you all to a point where you can take back some simple, very clear procedural things to do once you get back to the work site to remain in compliance and avoid any issues. Um, I'd like to introduce Jeanette Herrera from our Sacramento office and Michael Mazzoni from our Fresno office. And Jeanette, can you tell us about yourself? 
Thank you, Brennan. Uh, my name is Jeanette Herrera. I've been an attorney for eight years and practicing workers' compensation for eight years. I work in the Sacramento area uh, at Hannah Brophy, and I specialize in all things workers' compensation, particularly in serious and willful allegations, uh, 132A discrimination, and Cal OSHA. I'm also a certified workers' compensation specialist. I'll go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Mike. Thank you, Jeanette and Brenna. Thank you, Corbell, for this opportunity. My name is Michael Monsoni. Uh, I am an associate attorney also in my eighth year practicing everything workers' compensation. Uh, I also do handle uh, S&W and 132As and uh, also assist in the uh, Cal OSHA issues that pop up. Um, I am out of the Fresno office. Uh, I cover pretty much all of the Central Valley of California. Uh, dealing with a variety of different cases. And Mike is also a participant in our COVID Beard of the Year competition. Yeah. A little different from the icon on your screen. There you go. <laughs> Believe it or not, that is me there. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, we're lawyers. We have to give the disclaimer. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot today. We'll give a few examples during the course of our discussion. But we're not here to provide specific advice to you in any specific case. So if you have something come across your desk, please don't go back to your supervisors and say, Hannah Brophy or Corvell told us to always do things this way. Um, first of all, I would never say that. So um, we have to remember in workers' comp in particular, everything can change. As Michelle noted, the laws and regulations are changing frequently. The other thing is that every case is going to be fact dependent. So we are more than happy, as is Corvell, to talk to you offline about specific situations. And we'll have a Q&A after the educational portion of this today. Um, but please just filter what we're saying today as general advice. Think about how it applies to your specific facts. And then if you have a question about specific case handling strategies, please reach out to us separately. And we're more than happy to spend time with you through the specifics of your situation. Okay, so brought you here, what we're gonna talk about today, let's let's do the thing, right? Um, so COVID-19, we're gonna talk a little bit about current numbers, what we're experiencing, uh, your coffee, it's not good. Uh, support for each other right now, um, implementing these laws of our employee. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about which industries are most affected. And when we get into the OSHA discussions, you'll see that there is a correlation between the COVID numbers and some of the way that these regulations are being implemented by OSHA. Uh, so there is a logical link. Um, like it or not, there is a logical link. Um, Assembly Bill 685 is going to be the bulk of the presentation today. We'll talk about how it expands Cal OSHA's authority. We'll talk about defining potential exposures, how we look at outbreaks, because it is different than under the SB 1159 Workers' Compensation California COVID presumption statute definition of outbreak. We'll talk about serious violations, and we're gonna spend some time talking about the 1BY notices, whether or not and when or how you should be responding to those. And then we'll talk about the Cal OSHA emergency regulations. Uh, we'll talk about the status of those, as well as what you can do as a take home to sort of be the most prepared possible um, and be in compliance because those are now in effect. Mike, give us the, uh, the bad news. Will do. Um, as all of us have kind of seen on the news lately, uh, the numbers in California continue uh, to go up and up. Uh, we're now at over 1.2 million confirmed cases. Um, this is as of November 30th. In fact, I looked this morning and apparently there were over or close to 21,000 uh, new cases just in California within the last 24 hours. Wow. Uh, we're up possibly close to 20,000 fatalities from COVID-19. Um, we're um, seeing the, the bulk of these cases um, in the 18 to 49 uh, years of age bracket there as you go down here. Uh, that that number is uh, close to 730,000 confirmed cases. Now, why is this important? Well, that age group 
you know, really makes up a bulk of the workforce in California. That's also who's going out to bars and restaurants still, um, who's engaging in the economy here in the state of California. Um, so when legislators see that number, especially that bracket 18 to 49 years of age, and those cases getting so high, and um, the uh, infectious disease experts probably estimate that, that that number is going to jump significantly after uh, the Thanksgiving break that we just had. Uh, when they look at those numbers as a legislator, well, what do they do? Well, legislators make laws. Um, they have a duty to their constituents. So what do they do? Well, we've seen a barrage of different pieces of legislation come through. Obviously, uh, 1159 was mentioned. We're going to be discussing AB 685 today, and then also the um, administrative uh, law aspect of it as well with the division's emergency regulations. Everyone's scrambling to um, put pieces of legislation and regulations together in order to respond to these numbers. So uh, when we all look at these numbers, that's, that's basically... Um, the justification for these legislators here in the state to start writing laws. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. Now, from a yeah, and Mike, it's yeah. it's really interesting. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think people should pay attention to what's happening in their local counties as well, because what we've started seeing are challenges to stay at home orders. In San Diego, there was a challenge to restaurants being able to have outdoor dining that failed. And up in Los Angeles, a similar um, motion actually was carried and the judge ordered uh, the county to show cause as to why there couldn't be outdoor dining. So we're gonna see, you know, California is so big, we're gonna see differential standards being incorporated as well. So yeah. I would urge everybody to go to the, the California governor's website, not just for this data, um, CWCI and CCWC have some great statistics as well, but go to the governor's website because it does allow you to do a county by county search about current restrictions that may affect your business. Yeah, um, in fact, Governor Newsom's four tier system uh, is all laid out online. You can check and see where your county is as far as which tier it's in. My county, Fresno, just actually went back to the purple tier, which means widespread. Um, coronavirus infection, uh, and that uh, brings with it uh, different types of limitations on certain um, certain types of businesses. So you can check out that all online. Um, now, from a uh, workforce um, standpoint, I think we skipped a slide there. Um, we're, we're going to look at the infections um, per industry, and obviously, as, as you see, healthcare is um, greatly affected, and that's because those types of workers have to have contact with um, high risk um, patients. Uh, you're thinking, you know, hospitals, of course, uh, but doctor's offices, um, ambulance workers, uh, and, and also people like that. The, the, uh, Next industry you see is the public. Um, so safety officers, peace officers, government. Um, that's uh, also a large portion of um, the cases that we're seeing. Uh, and then manufacturing, um, that's that's a large one as well. Um, and, and OSHA really has uh, designated currently for the last few months, they've, they've designated certain industries for areas of scrutiny. Uh, we're seeing a lot of agricultural workers. Um, we're seeing a lot of healthcare worker or healthcare employers, excuse me, retail employers and manufacturing employers um, really be scrutinized by OSHA currently. We're seeing the vast vast majority of citations coming in those those industries. Uh, in fact, 25% have come in healthcare. 20% have come in agriculture, even though you see agriculture down at around 1500 claims. Um, the uh, chief Doug Parker believes that, that is a vast under reported. Um, specific industry there, um, 
the uh, issue, especially raised by agricultural labor advocates, is that uh, there's not enough training, there's not enough education going on for these types of workers. Um, obviously, there there could be a language barrier uh, and other issues like that, uh, which is another reason why a lot of this new legislation and regulations have been passed um, in order to protect those specific labor groups. Uh, and then going to um, the statistics on uh, the complaints, fatalities, and illnesses, this is what uh, Cal OSHA gets when you have to report a COVID-related case. Uh, normally, you have to report a case um, that requires an inpatient hospitalization. Uh, that's a little bit more than um, just requiring diagnostic testing. Uh, or just first aid care, and then also uh, COVID-related fatalities. So we see see the stats there. Almost 8,000 complaints received um, out of 13,000 total complaints just of COVID. We have 258 fatalities reported um, out of the 640 total cases <laughs> cases reported. Excuse me. Uh, and then we have almost a thousand serious illness cases, which require an inpatient hospitalization out of the over 4,000 serious injuries and illnesses. And again, you see healthcare uh, really dominating these uh, stats here. Obviously, they have the most contact with infected peoples. Um, they're going to be the most at risk. Um, and so this is what really has um, spurred a lot of these legislators and uh, governing boards to take action during this time. Yeah, and I think that when you look at whether or not to report as an employer to OSHA or any other entity, if you have questions, uh, if you say to yourself, this is an interesting case, usually that means it could go either way. It's a really good time to talk to an attorney, your broker or your TPA and get some good counsel as to the specific facts of your situation. There is not going to be a one size fits all. But um, Jeanette, you know, you and I have talked about COVID. And do you agree that COVID itself uh, is likely to be um, looked at by OSHA as a serious illness if it is contracted? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I think Cal OSHA is going to be looking at if it turns into a serious illness. We know that employers have to report uh, all serious illnesses and death uh, to Cal OSHA. And uh, if, when we have this reporting, then that could possibly trigger an investigation. Um, there are additional things that couldn't trigger an investigation. One is if there is a serious illness. Um, it could be also be a complaint. Um, it could be an anonymous complaint or with AB 685 um, or with uh, these emergency regulations. If you have outbreaks um, and you're reporting to the uh, local uh, regulatory jurisdiction, uh, there also could be an investigation. Yeah, thank you. So why don't you tell us what's going on with AB 685? Yeah, thank you, Brenna. So just as um, both my colleagues, Brenna and Michael have said, and uh, Michelle Tucker earlier from Corvell, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has created countless challenges for uh, employers uh, throughout the country, and particularly for California employers. Um, we initially had, to uh, initially had to maintain a safe and healthy workplace consistent with the Kalosha industry guidance with the Family First Coronavirus Response Acts, the Americans with Disabilities Act, if, if applicable, and then Senate 1159. Um, so here we are today, we have to go ahead and we're analyzing Assembly Bill 685. And employers have 28 days to prepare for this. It becomes effective January 1st, 2021. And not only that, um, as of three days ago, the Office of Administrative Law approved the Cal OSHA's emergency COVID regulation, and that's effective immediately. So I, I would say it's safe to say that uh, California employers will have their hands full in the month of December. So it's fine. Well, let's dig into Assembly Bill 685. This bill essentially does two things. It creates a statewide standard for how employers handle potential exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace and outbreaks of COVID-19 at the workplace. 
Secondly, the bill expands the powers and modifies some procedures of Kelosha to enforce COVID-19 related workplace safety. Bill 685 has eight different sections. Section four is the meat and potatoes of AB 685. This is your reporting and outbreak section. Section four creates a whole new labor code section, section 6409.6. Sections two, three, and five and six temporarily amends one of the labor code sections. These deal with Cal OSHA related issues. And then I like to think as of sections one, seven and eight as introductory and conclusion type sections respectively. They do not create or and do not modify any labor code section. Um, and for sections two, three, and five and six, they revert back to its original form in 2023. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, section one. So our legislator has declared that one of the best tools for limiting COVID exposure and minimizing a COVID spread is to gather accurate data. Um, our legislator has further declared it is critical to track workplace data for the Um, our legislators also acknowledge uh, that the current law lacks clarity on employer reporting requirements, and they find it imperative that COVID-19 tests and diagnoses be reported immediately, and they should be reported immediately in the occupational setting to members of the public and to the relevant state agency. So let's move on to section two and three. These two sections go hand in hand. AB 685 temporarily amends, as I mentioned earlier, Labor Code 6325 for two years in the years 20, 2021 and 2022. And then it reverts back to its original form, and that will be in Section 3. And what this does is it expands Cal OSHA's enforcement authority. Next slide, please. I decided to talk about section three first, and that was intentional. This is the law as it is in its current form. This is currently on the books now, and it's effective up till the end of this year. So let's go ahead and look at this section first before we go into the amended section, which will become effective as of January 1st, 2021. So in this labor code section, it provides that if Cal OSHA determines there is a risk of COVID-19 infection to comp constitute an eminent hazard to employees, um, DOSH has the authority to issue an order prohibiting use. It can, pro it can prohibit an order to, um, it can prohibit entry to that specific area. And it also can require conspicuous notice reflecting prohibition of entry. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, DOSH's authority is limited to this immediate dangerous area. It cannot shut down the entire business. It only can shut down the and only can issue the order prohibiting use to the particular area where the eminent dangerous is. Uh, next slide, please. So if Cal OSHA determines that there is a risk of COVID infection to constitute an eminent hazard in a work area, which could be a place of employment and operation or process, um, this is in the new section in section two, it can prohibit or limit entry. By creating this section, our legislators have essentially said they've taken away all the guesswork and any legal argument as to whether COVID-19 infection is an eminent danger. It is an eminent danger in the sole discretion of Cal OSHA if it determines that it is, and Cal OSHA can use this enforcement for power for COVID infection. So just like the original section, it can prohibit 
the, and the limit entry in that particular area. You also have to post notice. However, this and this is new to this section, it cannot materially interrupt the performance of certain industries. It cannot interform with the critical governing functions related to public health and safety functions, electrical power, and water. Uh, one thing I did wanted to add under sections two and three is that if Cal OSHA determines or suspects that there is a dangerous condition, employer could be faced with a crime. So if if you're reporting some sort of dangerous activity, I'm sorry, if you're reporting a serious injury, <clears throat> excuse me, I must admit I'm a little bit under the weather, so please bear with me. And a Cal OSHA investigator does go out there. It is reasonable to expect that a BOA, a Bureau of Investigator, investigator may come out uh, to determine if a crime has been committed and if there is a dangerous condition. And that was in the original section as in this. So we could see some uh, criminal investigations for COVID related in, uh, infections. Next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna get into the meat and potato of labor code of Assembly Bill 685. Brenna, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Jeanette. And um, uh, so we get to section four. This creates labor code 6409.6 for the legal junkies of you out there. And this is really where we find the employer reporting requirements. We've organized these slides so that you can uh, take them back with you and hopefully have some good resources. But again, if you have any questions about who, what, when, where to report to or about, please reach out to your attorney uh, at the appropriate time, which would be right away. Um, so Mike mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, the word respond. And I've always loved that word um, in conjunction with the idea of responsibility. Um, employers right now are being given additional responsibilities. And what that literally means, if you break it down, is your ability to respond. So right now, what we're trying to respond to are potential exposures to provide notice and information so that the appropriate governing authorities that now have authority to enforce these provisions, um, OSHA, the Departments of Public Health, um, state and local, um, are able to take that information and make it usable. To some extent, it's gonna be public access to information, um, we always have to be careful when reporting to protect your employees' private information to the extent possible. So that's another good area to check in with counsel is exactly what am I allowed to um, provide as far as the information when I'm reporting. But as you'll see, it's a little bit broader here than it was under the employer reporting requirements for SB 1159. So under subsection A of section 4 of AB 685, again becoming effective 1121, if an employer receives notice of a potential exposure, then the employer has one working day to provide written notice to all employees or their representatives, if any, and to all employers of any subcontracted employees, and this is key, who were on the premises at the same work site as the qualifying individual. So the qualifying individual is the person that essentially sparked this potential exposure uh, or needs to be notified, okay? Um, when we talk about the work also into definitions of what constitutes a work site, and we'll break down all of these topics in a little bit. First, let's talk about that method of notice. So the method of notice to the employees and the employers of subcontractors has to be in a manner that the employer normally uses to communicate employment related information. That means that if you have a multilingual uh, employee group that you need to communicate that to them in the language that is understood by the majority of your employees as well as in English. And there's a little bit of subjective accounting as to what's going to get the message across. But the underlying theme is that you need to be able to notify these folks in a way that they're likely to understand it. Um, now, if you have one person who speaks a strange dialect of some language that nobody else on the on the workforce speaks, try to communicate in a way that they'll understand it, but your team to some extent. 
as well. Um, you have to include this message okay, again in the way that you normally communicate to those employees. And they specifically say that that can include personal service, just delivering it to the person, um, written letters, email, or text messages. Okay. That notice to the employees and employers of subcontractors has to include information regarding COVID-19 related benefits that the employee might be entitled to receive. That includes all federal, state, local, and benefits. You have to notify them of options uh, so that the exposed employees know about the availability of COVID related leave, company sick leave, any state mandated leave, supplemental sick leave, or negotiated leave provisions under something like an MOU or union contract. Disinfection and safety plan has to be included within the notification uh, if you have one, uh, and that should be consistent with the CDC guidelines. If you don't have one, you need to get one in place. This is very important. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything magical. Disinfection and safety plans are pretty straightforward when it comes right down to it, but somebody has got to take the time to write it down and put it into place so it can be published to the people that have a right to know about it. Um, information contained on the Cal OSHA Form 300, um, but notice should not include the name or identifying information that's related to the qualifying individual or the employee exposed to the qualifying individual. So let's talk about potential exposure. Okay, this is an ambiguous term, um, but an employer is considered to have notice of a potential exposure when any of the following occur. So first, a public health official or a licensed medical provider advised the employer that an employee was exposed to a qualifying individual at the work site. Second, that an employee or emergency contact notifies the employer uh, that the employee is a qualifying individual. Third, that the testing protocols of the employer reveal the employee is a qualifying individual. And employers who are thinking of mandating or making available testing at the job site should pay particular attention to that uh, item there. And then finally, a subcontracted sub employer notifies the employer that a qualifying individual was on the work site of the employer notification. That last bullet point is going to be very important for all construction folks out there or for anybody who utilizes temporary staffing agreements or PEO type services uh, where you have other individuals working on the job site besides your own employees. All right, so that's potential exposure. Let's look at who is a qualifying individual. Um, someone is a qualifying individual if they test positive for COVID, if they're given a positive COVID diagnosis by a licensed healthcare provider, if they've been ordered to isolate by a public health official, and notice that isolate is different than quarantine. Isolate assumes that this person is sick with COVID or has been exposed to someone directly with COVID. It's not just a fear based on mild or um, that if the person dies due to COVID, they are a qualifying individual. Now notice that um, none of this requires specifically or discusses specifically that they got COVID on a work-related basis. Okay, the issue is they're a qualifying individual if they're at the work site and any of these uh, bullet points are met. So then we get to what's a work site, okay? Now for those of you who listen to our SB 1159, you'll see that there's some overlap in the definition of work site under AB 685 as well. So the work site is defined as a building store facility, agricultural field, or other location where a worker worked during the infectious period. The infectious period is a medical um, uh, period of time talking about what period of time this person is infectious following manifestation of the symptoms. And I believe at this point it's 10 days. Okay. Now it does not apply to building floors or other locations of the employer that a qualifying individual did not enter. So again, if we step back and we look at the idea that we're trying to isolate, um, not in the sense of isolate versus quarantine, but we're trying to identify those individuals who are at a work site and potentially exposed other individuals, okay? So if the person you're looking at that you think exposed other individuals never accessed a certain area of the work site, then that is not considered work site for purposes of this notification requirement. 
Now, in a multi worksite environment, the employer only has to notify the employees who are at the same worksite as the qualified individual. Very important because a lot of employers have been asking us, do I have to notify my entire workforce? No, uh, only those individuals uh, who are at the same worksite as the qualifying individual. Okay? And specifically, only those individuals who are entitled to notice under this rule. All right, so let's go through a little bit of an example here. Um, in this situation, Joy works in a one floor office building during regular working hours with nine other employees. So we have a total of 10 employees. The employer's IIPP requires, among other things, social distancing and masks. However, Joy takes a break at the same table with one of her other employees in the employee break room. Joy does not social distance or wear a mask while eating with her colleague. On December 29th, 2020, <clears throat> Joy's husband tests positive for COVID. Although Joy was immediately tested and the results were negative, her doctor diagnosed her with COVID on 1-1-21 and instructs her to isolate. Joy's brother-in-law then contacts Joy's employer to inform him that Joy was diagnosed with COVID and ordered to isolate. So based on what we've talked about so far, what are the employer's obligations in this scenario? Okay. So first of all, Joy is a qualifying individual. She was both diagnosed with COVID by a doctor, assuming that he's a licensed healthcare professional uh, and ordered to isolate. Okay, both of those bullet points satisfy our checklist from the earlier slide. The employer also has notice of potential exposure because Joy's brother-in-law informed her employer of the positive diagnosis and order to isolate. Not only does the employer in this case have to provide written notice to the one employee that Joy takes breaks with, but they also need to notify the other employees who were on the premises at the same worksite and floor as Joy. Exposure occurred during the infectious period because Joy works with all of these people on a regular basis. Trickier situations and where you might want to engage counsel are going to come up where you have intermittently appearing employees who may or may have actually worked in the same space during the infectious period. But on these facts, all the other employees who worked with her on a regular basis in that same location are going to need to be notified. So now the employer has to provide all of these employees with written notice that can be by, again, U.S. Postal Service, email or text of all the potential COVID related benefits, as well as the employer's disinfectant and safety plan. OK, it's very important to understand that outbreak we mentioned before uh, outbreak is a, a key term of 2020. Unfortunately, it is different under SB 1159. OK, SB 1159 imposes upon the claims administrator to identify whether or not there have been four or four percent of working employees in the last 45 days, but specifically in a 14 day period who've been infected uh, with COVID. Um, now, outbreak under AB 685 is different. OK, so here the CDPH, California Department of Public Health standard is used and it currently defines an outbreak as three or more laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 within a two week period among employees who live in different households. Okay, that may be very important for some of your employees if you have a lot of families or roommate type situations working at the job, but it's just three. Okay, so that's a very important number to circle here if you're trying to determine whether or not there has been an outbreak. And we'll see that come up again when Mike talks to us about the emergency regulations. Um, when employers are notified of a COVID-19 outbreak, as defined by the State Department of Health, of Public Health, the employer has 48 hours to do the following. It's 48 hours. Um, that's not two business days. <laughs> 48 hours. Um, notify the local public health agency in the jurisdiction of the work site. Provide specified information given the names, numbers, occupations. Um, specifically identifying work sites of the employees who meet the definition of having a exposure and a qualifying individual. Then you also have to report the business address and NAICS code of the work site where the qualifying individual works. The employer is also required to continue to provide notice to the local health department of any subsequent confirmed cases at the work site.
There is an anti-retaliation clause. Um, the employers in California may not and shall not, according to the, the law, uh, retaliate against a worker for disclosing a positive COVID test, diagnosis, or order to isolate. Whenever you see the word shall in a statute, that tells you that you're going to see cases for alleged violation of that rule. That is a mandate. And so I'm, I'm looking at, from a risk management perspective, if employers uh, are perceived as retaliating or if an employee files um, notification of a COVID positive test and then gets immediately laid off, employers are gonna be held liable for that. And that's not something that you wanna have to deal with. Um, employees, if they feel that the section is violated, violated, can file a complaint with the Division of Labor Standards. I would imagine that there are going to be resources set aside for the nature of these investigations. Now that said, my observation has been, um, and I, I manage our COVID unit at the law firm, I've talked to a lot of folks uh, state and nationally about this, most employers are doing their best to comply. Most employers are human, and most employers, I would say by far over 99% of those I speak with, really are trying hard to get this right. Okay, but there is uh, this and other similar provisions for those who choose not to uh, fulfill their obligations under the law. So I have confidence that employers are doing their best, and I would hope that that would be something in a similar investigation that would be noted and that they would be given credit for. Um, you may not get it perfectly, but if you're trying to do it right, I think that that's going to do well by you in the long run. Okay. Uh, now, public information, let's talk a little bit about that. The CDPH is required to make information obtained pursuant to the section available on its website. Um, it must allow the public to track the number and frequency of COVID outbreaks and the number of COVID cases and outbreaks by industry that are reported in a workplace. Um, there's some confusion here if the definition of outbreak uh, is the same. And once again, I want to reiterate, it is not the same under AB 685, and that should say SB 1159. Uh, if you printed out those slides, please circle that and put SB 1159. Sorry about that. Um, but again, no personally identifiable information can be provided. Uh, and that is because we don't want to just put every positive COVID person uh, up on the web for everybody to see. But based on similar statistics as what we went over at the beginning of this presentation, uh, it is important for all of us to have an Watching, okay, and especially for those employers who industries throughout the state, you need to take extra precaution uh, in each of those separate industrial spaces. Uh, all right, so there are some exclusions to AB 685 and the employer reporting requirements. Does not apply to health facilities as defined in the Health and Safety Code uh, 1250. Again, this is different than SB 1159, which also references the Health and Safety Code Section 1250, but limits that provision in SB 1159 to only specific A, B, C, M, and N subsections. Um, AB 685 does not apply to health facilities. Okay. AB 685 does not apply to employees who, as part of their duties, conduct COVID testing or screening. And it does not apply to employees who provide direct patient care of treatment to individuals known to test positive for COVID uh, or a person under investigation for COVID or in isolation, unless the qualifying individual is an employee at the same work site. Okay, a couple quick notes on the notice requirement here. These records and these reports have to be maintained by the employer for a period of three years. Seemed a little long to me. I was trying to think of various statutes of limitations that could be impacted here, but it's very plain letter in this rule. You got to keep them for three years. And that tells me that you also have to keep them in a format that could be readily presentable if there is a demand for those documents by an agency. Um, DOSH shall enforce the notice requirement by issuing citations alleging violations. Citations can be appealed consistent with section 6319. If you have OSHA citations or issues, I would highly recommend that you talk to the team about exactly how to handle those. Most citations and uh, issues similarly can be appealed and in most cases uh, taken down. So Jeanette, why don't you uh, let everybody listen to someone else for a minute. Let's talk about section five and six. 
Thanks, Brenna. So as I mentioned earlier, section five and six, this is a temporary amendment to labor code section 6432. And this is all involves changes to the process of the notice of intent to classify a violation as serious, also known as the 1BY notice. So let's just get right into it. Next slide, please. Again, we're going to go ahead and look at section six, which is in its current form now. And also comes back again on beginning on January 1st, 2023. But this section indicates when there is a rebuttable presumption of a serious violation and if it exists, and then and there is a realistic possibility of death or serious physical harm from an actual hazard created. That mean the if. If you have, if there is a realistic possibility of death or serious physical harm, and it has to be from an actual hazard created by the violation, um, it's pretty much well established that COVID-19 can, does have the possibility to create the ser a serious physical harm or death, um, but is it going to be from an actual hazard created by the violation? So an actual hazard is serious exposure exceeding permissible limits or an unsafe, unhealthy workplace practice. Uh, for COVID purposes, we're going to be, uh, I imagine Kellosh is going to be focusing on the unhealthy workplace practice. Um, the existence of a violation alone is not sufficient to establish a serious violation. Um, and so what's on the books currently is that before Cal OSHA can issue a violation, they have to issue a notice of intent to classify the violation as serious. Next slide, please. So once that notice is um, issued to the employer, the employer has the opportunity to rebut that presumption. They should provide a written notice to the DOSH agency indicating that the employer did not know or could not have reasonably known that there was the presence of the violation. And the employer has 15 days to respond to this. Again, this is what is under the original form of section 6432. Uh, there has been, there's different schools of thought as to whether the employer, uh, if we can go back to thank you. Uh, there's different schools of thought as to whether the employer should even respond to the YB notice. And that is because the employer is not barred from presenting additional evidence um, to the Cal OSHA appeals board, and there's no negative inference. So if the employer does receive a serious violation, if and they don't respond to this, if they don't respond to the YB, uh, 1BY notice, if it goes to the appeals board, there's not gonna be an evident, a negative inference uh, drawn by the administrative law judge. However, if they do respond and they provide different information, uh, the trier of fact could draw a negative inference on that differing information. So it's been our position at the firm for quite a long time that the employers should not respond to the 1BY notice and take the serious violation and take it up with the appeals board. So let's move on to section five. This is the temporarily amended labor code section, which comes into effect for two years beginning on January 1st, 2021. I put the quote um, at the very top of this slide to indicate that this is where the changes are found in section five. It's very small and it just says that paragraph two of subdivision B and subdivision D shall not apply. But when you go back to subdivision B and D, this is what that means. So it modifies the process for when Cal OSHA can issue um, a serious citation. There's no more 1BY notices. Cal OSHA no longer has to give a notice of intent to issue a serious citation. They can just issue the notice uh, immediately. I like the picture in the corner uh, because it, I think, a picture is worth a thousand words. I, I'm not too concerned about this. I don't think that employers are going to be uh, face particular harm by not receiving this notice. Um, and uh, 
Lastly, uh, by taking away this notice, the issue of employer providing contradictory information uh, to an appeals board trier fact is expressly repealed. So I don't think employers should be too concerned about this section. Okay, um, let's move on to section seven and section eight. This is our conclusion sections. So this section provides that no reimbursement is required by this act uh, that may be incurred by a local agency or school district. Um, and that is because it creates or modifies a new crime or infraction within the meaning of the government code. As I indicated earlier, sections two or three could potentially create a crime if there is a dangerous condition. Um, there is an exception. Um, the exception is, is, if, is that if the commission of state mandates determines that AB 685 contains another other costs mandated by the states that require reimbursement. That's the only exception and it's most likely not going to happen. Generally speaking, there's not going to be reimbursements to any local agency or school district. So moving on to section eight, I think section eight is important because it imposes the legislator declares that there is a limitation on the public's right to access and they find that the need to protect the privacy of employees from public disclosure of their personally identifiable information outweighs the interest in public disclosure of that information. You can think back to a section four where the in providing information. Oh, Jeanette, I'm sorry, you cut out just for a second there. Can you go back to, you were saying, think back to section four. Thank you, Brenna. If you think back to section four, there's obviously a tension between HIPAA and uh, providing notice to potentially exposed employees. This section makes clear that there is the interest in in uh, protecting personally identifiable information. So employers could in, rely on that. And in that, um, there is a section in section four of that Brenna talked about earlier about if they're supposed, uh, employers are supposed to provide information to potentially exposed employers, employees in regards to uh, consistent with what's required on log 300, um, unless the information is inapplicable. I think it's safe to say that section eight provides that personally identifiable information is inapplicable. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our Cal OSHA emergency COVID regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. That's some great information on 685. Um, but now we have these uh, these Cal OSHA emergency COVID regulations, which overlap a little bit, but there are a few differences that I think we need to highlight as well. Um, these um, came out just recently, actually. Uh, Cal OSHA's board voted unanimously um, a few weeks ago to expand regulations. Um, obviously, as we've talked about, to do more to to protect those um, employees. We're having to go in during uh, to work during the pandemic. Um, this, as we uh, as we hinted at earlier, uh, came uh, amid opposition from a lot of employer groups uh, because it imposes quite a few um, obligations, uh, which could come in the form of monetary obligations. And obviously, we we've seen during the last nine, ten months. I can't even keep counting anymore how many months it's been since this whole thing started. Um, but employers have been hurting. Um, I have friends uh, who own businesses who um, are really, I mean, they, they've been taking a hit. Um, uh, so all of this just, um, it's, it's the cherry on top for a lot of employers right now with these extra burdens. Um, these are temporary regulations um i want to note um currently um they are in effect for 180 days and i just want to point out too um the uh, division has been citing a lot of employers for non-compliance with uh, a lot of the current standards that were in place for the last nine months um 
under HCCR 3203, uh, which mandates that every employer uh, have an existing IIPP, which is an injury and illness prevention plan. Uh, that's been on the books for years and years. Every employer should have one. OSHA has been finding creative ways to use that section uh, to cite people and issue proposed penalties. Uh, we've seen a lot of that lately. Um, I think with the implementation uh, of these emergency regulations, which are covered under section 3205, I think you'll see the division going out and trying to make an example of somebody and cite 3205 if there's non-compliance. And I'll get into some of the details uh, of what makes up 3205. It's quite a bit. It's quite a bit um, for employers to comply with. We've also seen um, a lot of the other regulations cited. Uh, 342 is another one, failure to report to OSHA any serious injury or death. Um, and then a, a, a laundry list of others, including under the ATD standard, which I'll, I'll touch on briefly as well. Um, all right, so let's uh, get into the emergency reg. I know I'm limited on time here, but I will try and highlight the most important things for all of you to take away today. Um, these are temporary regulations, as I said, they're in effect for only 180 days, but uh, the uh, board can vote to extend uh, that time frame uh, for two periods of 90 plus days. So they can extend it for 90 days. And if they need to extend it another 90 days, they can. But that's that's the max time limit on these things right now. Uh, the employers who are covered, pretty much everybody. Um, <laughs> the uh, regulation states all places of employment uh, there are exceptions. Um, if you have one employee who doesn't have public contact, then um, you're not bound by these standards. And if you're already bound by the ATD standard, which is the aerosol transmissible disease standard, that applies mainly to uh, healthcare facilities, people who have um, high contact uh, with aerosol transmissible disease, which uh, SARS coronavirus is. Um, and so those those types of industries are already covered by a, a more stringent standard and rules by the ATD standard. So those are not covered as well. Um, all right. So I wanted to highlight for you because I know I, I'm running out of time here. Uh, four uh, major takeaways here that we have from uh, this emergency regulation that employers really need to be aware of. First is the implementation of a written COVID-19 prevention plan. Yes, it has to be written. You just can't come to your employees one day and say, hey, I have a COVID-19 prevention plan in place. No, it has to be written down. There's templates uh, online. You can work with us uh, to get one prepped and ready to go. Uh, it, in fact, it has to be <laughs> in now because the regulations have already uh, been in effect for a couple of days now after the OAL um, adopted these regulations. Um, so you need a COVID-19 prevention plan. There's a lot of elements to that. I'll get into that quickly. Uh, the reporting requirements under section 3205, um, subsection C3, uh, and also C9, that's where um, the bulk and the most infor the most information on reporting and record keeping and who to report to and what to report, that's all there in those subsections of 3205. Um, and then also we have testing, ob testing obligations, excuse me, of employers uh, during outbreaks and, out and the, uh, the regs list two types of outbreaks. You have just the outbreak that's defined as uh, three infections at the place of employment in a 14 day period, uh, which I think is currently the CDPH standard. Um, and then you have a major outbreak where uh, you have the employer have to take on the burden of additional testing. Um, so those uh, that that covers the third highlight. And then lastly, uh, you have COVID-19 prevention in employer provided housing and employer provided transport. This is the one that the agricultural worker advocates were really harping on since we saw quite a few um, uh, 
labor uh, housing areas that were having large outbreaks. Okay, so um, the COVID written prevention plan. Um, a lot of elements here. You need a system for communicating about COVID-19 with your employees. Um, so this is um, really talking about the, the what constitutes COVID-19 symptoms, the exposures, uh, hazards at the workplace, procedures and policies for accommodating employees uh, with medical conditions that makes them susceptible um, to a more serious illness. Um, a method of identifying and correcting COVID-19 hazards, uh, but I really want to touch on uh, the some of the most important aspects of the first part of this regulation uh, under subsection C3 is investigating and responding to COVID-19 cases. Uh, this is when you have um, a suspected case or a confirmed case. You need to determine the day and time the COVID-19 case was last present and to the extent possible, the date of the positive COVID-19 test slash diagnosis. Determine who have who may have had exposure. And this is important because uh, this this will this will help the employer um, find out who needs to be notified of that uh, positive test. I've, I've seen a lot of questions in the in the. Q and A section. You know who who do we need to notify? Which employees do we need to notify? Well, the regulation states that if you had COVID nineteen COVID nineteen exposure, it means being within six feet of a COVID nineteen case for a cumulative total of fifteen minutes or greater in any twenty four hour period within or overlapping with the high risk exposure period for that COVID nineteen case. So um, you got to go back and investigate and find out who. Uh, the COVID-19 case, uh, which is a person who has a positive COVID-19 test or diagnosed by a doctor, who they had contact with, because that's who you need to notify, as this section says, that you must give notice of this potential exposure within one business day to all employees who may have had exposure and with their authorized representatives, could be a union uh, rep, could be, uh, could be their attorney, <laughs> Uh, and and also, this is a little bit more expansive than AB 685 and independent contractors and other employers present at the workplace during the high risk exposure. So you need to go back and find out who was on your work site, which employees, and you have to give notice within one business day to all those people. Uh, and then and also, I think Mike, yeah, if I could just reiterate here that that one. or when we should have known, right? I mean, obviously we're not gonna know of all cases right when they happen. No, yeah, and 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 the regulation states that you need to do the best you can to determine the day and time the COVID-19 case was present. So if you can pin down a date, uh, that's when the employer knew or, or should have known. Um, and they also need to um, Check with symptoms. I mean, that that's that's part of these regulations as well. Screening all of that. If you're if you're monitoring your employees, you, you kind of know what's going on. You know, maybe if they had symptoms or were going to get a test. Uh, also, um, it, another important part of this regulation is that the employer must offer COVID nineteen testing at no cost to employees during their working hours who had potential COVID nineteen exposure. So if you have an employee who you've checked on, they have a positive test, you investigate who uh, may have had exposure, the employer now has to offer uh, testing at no cost to anyone who had that exposure. So the six feet, more than 15 minutes within a 24 hour period. Um, the other big takeaway, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm running a little late, I hope that's okay, um, but um, the reporting and record keeping and access, I saw a lot of Q and A's about that. Uh, the employer shall report information about COVID-19 cases of the workplace to the local health department uh, and shall provide any related information requested by the local health department. Um, now, it's different for an outbreak. We're just talking about one case. Uh, the employer shall report immediately to the division any COVID-19 related serious illnesses or deaths. So, you don't have to report. 
uh, to Cal OSHA if it's just one case, and it does not require an inpatient hospitalization or it doesn't result in death. But if that happens, you must report to OSHA. Uh, and this is also different for for the outbreak section as well. But those are the two really main points of the first section 3205. There's there's other things that you need in the written COVID prevention plan, employee training, like I talked about. Um, it, it may need to be in a different language, the language most spoken by your employees. Uh, just a quick um, look at some of the differences. We see overlap one business day notice requirement uh, for notifying your employees of a, of a potential exposure. Uh, the key individuals must be notified exclusive representative versus um, the um, representative authorized representative in the regulations, but you also see um, the regulations taking a little bit broader look at who needs to be notified independent contractors, um, anyone else on the work site, other employers, people like that. Uh, the notice doesn't have to be written for the regs. Uh, and as I said, you have a more expansive list. Uh, and then there's the obligation to provide testing. Uh, this is also the case if you have a uh, major or minor outbreak. Uh, the employer has to test all employees who have had potential exposure uh, to that confirmed COVID-19 case. Uh, so this obviously shifts the burden immensely to the employer to really conduct all the investigation, the record keeping, the testing, uh, and it's uh, the the government officials are wiping their hands hands clean of it, unfortunately. So it's it's a lot for the employers to digest, um, especially when a lot of employers have already been hurting. Um, and as I mentioned, yes, um, we have um, the issue with the uh, outbreaks. If you have an outbreak, just as in um, just as in AB 685, you have to notify the local health department. Uh, you have to notify the local health department for the regulations within 48 hours. Um, and um, there's a lot of different information that you need to provide. And I know I'm running out of time, um, but if <laughs> anybody That's has okay, any, other, yes, if anyone has any specific questions about the the meat and bones of these regulations, feel free to email or ask during the question period. Uh, talked about with the emergency regs, we have well, has gracious to um, distribute to attendees of the webinar today. Thank you. Um, thank you to our panelists. I know there is a ton to digest here. Um, my dad's a business owner in California, and we've really have been trying to move through this information. Um, and even certainly with my personal experience in this industry, it's very difficult. It is very time consuming. And what we have made a decision is just really to utilize folks like these folks today on our panel uh, and use resources and reach out to those folks who are really most close and have the, the level of expertise that's needed. One thing that we did want to provide, and again, we'll, this will be distributed to everyone, is some testing information to you. Um, because of these new provisions, we know that testing has to be available and in some situations, obviously provided by the employer. Rite Aid, um, not only in California, but nationally through their um, website, will provide you with COVID testing sites. Again, across the country, they have that in a, quite a few number of states. And then there also is a California state testing information site. And that will show you specific to California where there are testing sites available for you to use. So again, we'll get this distributed out to everyone. We'll try and continue to feed you information. Um, there are a couple pieces of things I would recommend if you're going to send someone for testing or you have an obligation to provide testing, reach out ahead of time to the testing facility. We are hearing again of some shortages in some areas and some uh, different levels of requirements needed to get testing. So again, before you send an employee somewhere or send a number of employees somewhere to be tested, I would make sure you reach out to that location ahead of time. So we've reached the end of the educational piece. And so Matt, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn off the recording.
if you don't mind. 